I don't know if you were paying attention to astronomy news, but a couple of months ago, a month ago, something like that, uh, a team of scientists announced that they had managed to take a picture of a black hole. And uh, I thought that was rather intriguing, so I, I stopped and paid attention and, and listened to some of the interviews. And, uh, and, and they went into a great deal of detail about how they did it. And, and most of the time in science news, that's uh, unusual, especially when you're trying to explain things to the general public. And so I thought, well, what's, what, what are they getting at here? And a lot of what they were trying to explain was the image processing aspect of what they had done. And I thought, at that point, <clears throat> I'm, I'm an electrical engineer and a, a ham radio operator, so I've got some experience with radio, right? And, and I've got a, a pretty good amount of experience with astronomy. And I thought, well, surely this radio astronomy thing's a lot simpler than I thought, but maybe not, because the way they were going into it, it clearly uh, meant I didn't understand some things. So I thought I'd do a presentation on explaining how to image a black hole using very long baseline interferometry in, uh, in aperture synthesis interferometry in radio astronomy. And I started studying that and researching it, and then I thought maybe it needs to be not quite so deep. <laughs> so this is going to be um, more of an introduction to radio astronomy, some brief overview of what they did to image this black hole. I hope to have a better understanding of that later, and maybe I'll do another presentation uh, later on the details of it. Uh, it is fascinating, and uh, it suits my adult ADD problem, which basically is I have too many hobbies, you know. Like I said, I'm an amateur astronomer, I'm an amateur radio operator. Oh boy, I get to mix them both up now. So uh, <clears throat> this is what they came up with. Uh, this is the Galaxy M87 uh, in a really good telescope like the Hubble. That's what it looks like. Uh, if you zoom in on it, you can, this is an x-ray image showing this jet of high velocity particles. And that's how they know that there's a black hole here, besides simply the fact that they've already figured out by now that almost every large galaxy has a black hole at the center of it. <clears throat> this one happens to be spinning really fast and, and accreting a lot of matter into the disk. And that's spinning up those particles in a, in a very strong magnetic uh, field that is accelerating particles to nearly the speed of light, and they're shooting out way past the galaxy. And um, in fact, actually, I think you can see it right there, too. Um, and so they knew there was a black hole there. This is about 54 million light years away, a whole lot further than the closest massive black hole that we have to us, which is called Sagittarius A star, and it's at the center of our own galaxy. And throughout the course of this, you'll start, maybe start to understand why we didn't try to take a picture of that one. So, how did they do that? Radio astronomy is not an old science, not nearly as old as uh, the Galilean uh, observations of, of uh, the Jupiter's moons. Um, they said basically, after the invention of radio and the uh, advent of tele transatlantic telecommunication by radio, they saw they had a noise problem. And they were trying to find out what the sources of this radio noise was. And um, Carl Jansky, who worked for Bell Labs, the rulers of the universe at that time, and for many years after that, 
um, was on a mission to find what these radio sources were. And he measured um, one of the noisiest sources, which was at this frequency, 21 megahertz, 14.5 meters. Uh, we'll talk about the relationship of wavelength to frequency in a little bit, but that's essentially the same thing. <clears throat> and, uh, and what he found was that the signal he was measuring peaked every day at 23 hours and 56 minutes. And of course, he thought it was the sun. And of course, that says it's not the sun, because if it was the sun, it would peak every 24 hours. So it's got to be something out in space of the sidereal rate of the rotation of the Earth, something away from the sun. And uh, in fact, it was an astronomer friend that pointed that out to him. He didn't stumble across that one himself. Um, that was a huge event when they figured that out. In fact, what he, this antenna is actually uh, will rotate. It was built to turn, it'll spin on this carousel of wheels right here. And he was able to basically use that antenna to determine that this noise was coming from the center of our own galaxy. And that was huge news back in that day. <clears throat> you know, radio signal from the center of our galaxy. Um, so that was, uh, that was the beginnings of radio astronomy. Bell didn't have any uh, interest in that. Now that they knew what the source was, they didn't care. So Mr. Jansky was given other assignments not to pursue uh, radio astronomy, but he certainly got something started. <clears throat> the first amateur, the first dish type radio telescope was built by an amateur radio operator uh, in Illinois, I think it was. And it was a nine meter dish. This is a picture of it. And uh, he did follow up with uh, Jansky's work. He repeated that work. He made measurements, found other off-world sources of radio signals in much higher frequencies. And we'll talk about some of those in a few minutes. But this is really probably where radio astronomy started. Another famous event in radio astronomy, again, Bell Labs at it, trying to find out who's incringing on their uh, space and their uh, attempts to communicate, <clears throat> searching for noise. And um, Penzias and Wilson discovered a background signal that persisted everywhere at roughly 408 megahertz. And they, they could not get rid of it. They had, they had uh, cryogenically cooled receivers in here. They're trying to find that noise in their own electronics. Uh, there was uh, the, the famous story here is that they even thought it might have been the pigeon poop inside the antenna. So they got in there and cleaned all that out and, and eliminated any possibility of nearby noise or anything, couldn't do it. And basically at that point, uh, they too talked to some other physicists who happened to be astrophysicists and suddenly uh, realized that they had stumbled across something other people had been trying to prove, which was that there was a cosmic microwave background, which was the, essentially the proof of the Big Bang theory of the uh, origin of our universe. They got a Nobel Prize for that in 1978. <clears throat> but my buddy Nikola Tesla, uh, he's a character I've always uh, really enjoyed. Um, out of the box thinker in a lot of uh, respects. Uh, is the first person who ever uh, wrote about using a direction finding antenna to uh, locate radio signals. So if in the true vein of things, he was really the guy that invented uh, radio astronomy. So everything uh, is electric. And, and I, I 
people don't, that don't think they want to understand stuff about electricity, you need to understand stuff about electricity. Everything is electric. Your, your existence is electric. You're made up of electric charges. The, your entire, the reason my hand that, ouch, doesn't go straight through this table is because the negatively charged electrons that make up the atoms of my hand are repelled by the negatively charged electrons, much denser elect negatively charged electrons that make up this granite tabletop. That's an electrical repulsion is what, that, is what that's about. <clears throat> you move electrons fast enough and they create radio waves. And these radio waves go, uh, have a very wide range. The, was, I guess it was, um, uh, oh God, I can't believe I can't remember his name right now. Um, Newton. The guy that figured out that light was uh, was a radio wave. Uh, what was it? Maxwell. Maxwell. Yeah, I couldn't hear it. <laughs> so, uh, visible light that we see is a radio wave. It's an electromagnetic wave, and, but it's a very small part of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, long waves down here are uh, radio waves that are used by submarines to communicate. They can actually get through water. Um, right in here are your uh, AM, FM radio, VHF uh, TV, UHF television. Uh, microwaves are in here, and that includes radar and your uh, cooking uh, microwaves. There's thermal infrared, infrared, um, ultraviolet light, and x-rays, and gamma rays. And all these are higher frequencies. Higher frequencies equate to shorter wavelengths. Long, long, lower frequencies are long wavelengths. Um, and uh, higher frequencies are higher energies. So this is a this is a set of relationships that uh, permeate all of physics. So uh, these are some relative sizes of the wavelengths uh, in these ranges. Microwaves uh, are about the size of butterflies, and this is uh, a, a waveform, a you know peak to peak sinusoidal wave. Uh, the distance between those moving at the speed of light. And, but it also is why it takes high energies to see small things. Um, for example, to, to see uh, atoms, you've got to have x-rays. And uh, because otherwise the wave is bigger than that. Uh, there's also uh, the whole uh, Rayleigh genes temperature correspondence with all this we'll talk about as well a little bit. This is the, uh, our, ga our galaxy in multiple wavelengths. So where is visible here? Vis optical, right here. So. This is a, an image of basically our galaxy. Um, this is back toward the center of our galaxy. As you can see, most of our galaxy is obscured by dust that disappears in the near infrared. Here is mid-infrared, infrared, infrared uh, much brighter. Uh, molecular hydrogen, so this is gonna be um, 1.4 gigahertz frequency, so this is a, a long, a very long wave, um, and it's going to be. I'll tell you. I'll, I'll talk about how that radio signal is produced. Uh, two radio, 2.5 gigahertz, atomic hydrogen. You know what? This is uh, this is what's 1.4 gigahertz right there. Uh, this is X-ray. What our universe our our galaxy looks like an X-rays, and then our gamma ray, high energy stuff. And I have 
an infrared camera and I want to demonstrate one of the properties of infrared that I have always found fascinating. <laughs> so here we have a clear piece of plastic, right? So we can see through it, and actually what you're seeing through there is reflections of heat from the camera. So infrared is bouncing off of this piece of plastic like it was, well, not quite like a mirror, but uh, uh, it is not going through the plastic at all. Here is something that visible light doesn't go through but infrared goes through just fine. That's just cool. <laughs> this is why it gets so hot in your car when it leaves, stays in the sun. Visible light in the, in the higher spectrum shines right through the clear glass, warms up the dash, the dash re-radiates that at a lower frequency in the infrared, which can't get back through the glass. It's stuck in the car, and it heats, it, and it heats up and uh, goes through a vicious cycle of, of staying hot. Um, so there's my infrared demo. Oh, come on. Okay. All right. So um, our atmosphere is uh, transparent to some wavelengths of electromagnetic energy and not to others. And it's one of the reasons that we have to have space-based telescopes for some of this. Um, and one of the reasons that radio astronomy has become quite so popular. And it's uh, uh, another feature that is uh, taken advantage of by ham radio operators at certain uh, wavelengths. So this is visible light. And while they don't show any uh, obscuration to visible light, of course, we know there's some. Uh, there's at least water vapor gets in there and messes with it. <clears throat> but um, some infrared gets through, but as you get into uh, the longer infrared wavelengths, that's blocked by um, the atmosphere. And this is where, uh, right along in here, is where the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be sensitive. Uh, reason for that is uh, uh, Doppler shift. Right, so the, the last camera that they installed on the Hubble was an infrared camera so that they could take pictures of light emitted from very severely Doppler shifted galaxies way back at the earliest parts of our universe. But that can only go back so far with that camera. The James Webb is going to be a purely infrared telescope. Uh, <coughs> when infrared telescopes use gold for their reflectors because it'll go right through silver. Uh, so that's why you couldn't put a, a very long infrared camera in the Hubble because the mirrors are, are uh, aluminized mirrors. Um, but with the James Webb, they'll be able to see back to the very earliest beginnings of our universe, hopefully early star formation, early galaxies, and, uh, and that. So uh, radio telescopes uh, work in a lot longer wavelengths. There we have gamma x-ray, we have the Compton X-ray uh, Observatory uh, in space to look at x-rays, and there's the uh, gamma ray 
uh, telescope. <clears throat> so, some of the things that generate radio signals in space so far haven't been aliens that we could detect. Uh, but there are, are lots of sources out there. The sun is one. Uh, Jupiter's magnetosphere uh, creates a lot of radio noise. In fact, it sings. Uh, it's kind of interesting to hear that on radio. Uh, black holes uh, do in a lot of different, and, and these are the processes mostly that generate those, um, those signals. Synchrotron radiation, highly accelerated uh, particles, mostly electrons that uh, uh, will create radio waves. Uh, Bremsstrahlung radiation, uh, I think that is more to do with when electrons smash into something and then free electrons and that creates radio waves. I'm not uh, good on that one. Interstellar dust uh, is, uh, it will absorb and re-emit uh, radiation from nearby stars. It'll also create thermal radiation from the dust particles running into each other. Um, and then there's a spin, spin flip transition of hydrogen, which I think is a cool process we will talk about in a minute. Um, neutron stars, pulsars, these are all uh, highly magnet, magnetic uh, fields that are generally spinning and causing radio noise, supernova remnants, star forming regions that comes out of the interstellar dust thing, cosmic microwave background we've talked about. It's just leftover thermal energy from the early Big Bang. And extragalactic pulses, there are um, bursts of high energy gamma rays that to date they still are not entirely sure about. Yes, sir? I don't want to bore anybody, and y'all can cut me up if you want to, but I'm a radiologist and we, we utilize a brim and if anybody's interested in what that is, it has to do with when an electron gets close enough to a nucleus, which of course has a positive charge. And so that, nu that nucleus will deflect the course of the electron, in effect slowing it down. And so that because of conservation of energy, there will be that energy emitted. And since we use a tungsten target, that brimstone radiation is in a proper x-ray energy range for us to use. So that's what Bremsstrahlung is, radiation that's mediated, is emitted when an electron is essentially deflected and slowed down and loses energy and that energy is then emitted. As a radio source. Very uh, cool. Breaking in German. Like that, that's, what it's, that's what else it's called. It's called breaking radiation. So. Synchrotron, synchrotron has also got another German name, magneto uh, And this has to do with uh, electrons spiraling out of uh, a control in a high velocity jet, I think. I'm not, uh, I didn't follow that one too well. But this is one of the big radio sources of uh, synchrotron radiation. It's this. Uh, black hole and Cygnus A. This is uh, the coma cluster and uh, a radio uh, image of this. So it's showing you something you wouldn't otherwise see. And this is the uh, breaking radiation. Interstellar dust, again, this is uh, absorption and scattering and re-radiation and radiation. So that's, uh, uh, there's some explanations here, but the emission from thermal uh, energy, molecular thermal energy is uh, uh, where a lot of it comes in infrared ranges. This is, I thought this was fascinating. And this is one of the early signals found in one of the earliest um, maps of the sky was done in this 1420 uh, megahertz range. 
Apparently, if a hydrogen atom bumps into another hydrogen atom, the one, one of the electrons can flip. Normally, this, they're stable, spinning in the, uh, bi basically the proton and the electron spinning in the same direction. It, it runs into something, it flips the electron, and this is a, a thousand year decay uh, for that electron to flip back. Uh, but apparently enough of it happened a thousand years ago that uh, it's constantly flipping back. Well, and lots of that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's right. So uh, uh, there's a whole lot of hydrogen out there emitting uh, radio waves at 1,420 megahertz. And uh, this is going to be the focus of my first radio telescope. So uh, this is a typical radio telescope, much like an optical telescope. It'll have a parabolic primary, a secondary, a Cassegrain style focus where the Basically, the signal is reflected back through the primary and into the radio antenna. Uh, this is kind of what the, uh, essentially what the camera would look like that would be hooked up to an optical telescope, except this is just a waveguide and a, essentially a, a, a quarter wave dipole antenna in the middle of that, in the, in the little box. <coughs> This is an off-axis version of a radio telescope. Um, these are, it's a cluster of them. You can see that basically the, uh, unlike most optical telescopes, you're getting the uh, obstruction out of the way of the reflector. Um, and uh, gathering light that way. And this is the most common uh, version of that that there is out there. There's uh, one on a lot of roofs around town. This is a big telescope and just like with optical telescopes, aperture matters. Um, uh, bigger is better. This is the Arecibo 305 meter telescope. It was went into operation in 1963. This is uh, a, this is a parabolic dish I believe and this uh, this is the receiver, and it doesn't have it doesn't reflect back through the center, and it, and where this is positioned along here, and this cable system, how this is turned and where this is positioned, determines what direction this uh, telescope is looking in. Otherwise, it's looking straight up, right? But it is steerable by uh, moving the position of the of the receiver in this reflected beam. And not to be outdone, uh, the Chinese have in recent, yes, yeah, Richard. Oh, well I was gonna say about uh, Arcebo, um, I heard that like a couple of years ago when that big hurricane went through Puerto Rico that it got damaged. Do you know if it's back in operation? I do not. Okay. It's back. It is, okay. Excellent. Um, the Chinese have built uh, a very large dish antenna. This is 500 meters. Uh, this dish is, I believe, spherical in design, and I can't see it. I, I'm thinking the receiver is sitting right down here in the middle right now. What they do with this one is there's a cable system for all these different towers that will suspend this receiver up above the dish. And they have a set of actuators under the dish that will pull it into parabolic shape and they do that they can do it in different spots on the dish so they'll like pull this section of the dish into a parabolic shape and locate the receiver over here to point the telescope in that direction and uh, it's a fascinating concept they've had problems with the actuators I'm not sure where they stand with getting that up and running. No, but made in China. I'm sorry? They weigh made in China. <laughs> That's right, made in China. What? The last I heard was not quite oh working right. That is so funny, Joe. Yeah. 
I, I, I'm not sure it is quite working uh, yet, but uh, uh, they will get it fixed, I'm sure. This is called FAST, this is the name of that telescope. And to date, it is the world's largest single telescope, largest diameter single telescope. So, but aperture does matter, and it, it uh, just like with optical telescopes, the bigger the aperture, the better the resolution you can achieve with it. And angular resolution is what you're looking at with a large optical telescope, a one meter uh, mirror can produce a 0.125 arc second resolution. Now, does everybody understand what that is? Arc seconds and how that re pertains to resolution. It's basically the width of the smallest thing you can make out in the sky. So <clears throat> a single radio dish has a, of 25 meters, okay, about 80 feet, is gonna have a resolution of 10,000 arc seconds. All right, that's better than three degrees. And that's bigger than the moon. You know, the moon's about a one degree, I think, is uh, half a degree. Yeah. So this is about three degrees, right? So, so you've got one, one spot in the sky you're measuring the radio brightness for at three degrees with a 25 meter dish. Not good resolution. <clears throat> you can take an array of telescopes and through aperture synthesis, synthesis, interferometry, synthesize a telescope with a 25 kilometer um, aperture and get down to 10 arc seconds. And that's not bad, but if you use, uh, and this is a very large array out in uh, Arizona, and, and I'll show you a picture of that. That's, uh, and it actually get up to 35 kilometers, I think. The, uh, but the very long baseline interferometry tel using telescopes placed across the world, they're able to get a uh, image of, at 10,000 kilometers down to 0 0.025 arc seconds. The uh, Event Horizon Telescope, which was the project that did the image of the black hole, was able to resolve essentially a, something the size of an orange on the moon. And I don't know, that's, I think that's even smaller than the 0 0.025 arc seconds. So, uh, got down to uh, micro arc seconds. Yeah. So this is the very large array operated by the National Radio Observatory. Um, this is on, these antennas um, are, can move on a set of rails. This is their close configuration. When they're spread out, they go out about 35 kilometers. Um, and it is an impressive array. Of course, this is the uh, uh, scene not the not the scene, but this is the telescope uh, array you saw in the movie Contact, I think it was. Uh, so, <laughs> NRO, what's that? National Radio Observatory. They operate most of the nation's big radio observatories. Green Bank. Um, uh, they've got several several How large telescopes. I'm sorry. How are they funded? I don't know. National, National Science Foundation, I imagine. Yeah, there's National Science Foundation. I think that leaves us. <laughs> <laughs> is yeah. that the same as NRAO, or they changed the name, or what? Because it used to have radio astronomy in the observatory. I don't know. I'll have to look. I just call it being NRO. It might be AO. I might have left that out. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about interferometry and how they do that. Um, basically, if you've got two radio antennas, and, and this is, uh, is an a old principle even in uh, 
ham radio operation or, or any, any radio operation. It's the same, this uh, phasing of antennas uh, is how big powerful AM radio stations broadcast uh, radios in a certain direction at night. They used to change, I think, W. SM, WW, what was the Chicago station? WGM, I think. WGM. Uh, yeah, but the one in Chicago that you could hear here every night when I was a kid, I don't ever listen to them anymore, but uh, uh, they, they used radio fa antenna phasing to get the signal to move in a certain direction. <coughs> this, when you've got a signal coming in, to two antennas, one's going to get to one antenna before it gets to the other. You know, even if they were straight overhead, it's not likely to get there at exactly the same time. But if that's it, most of the time they're not, and one signal will get to one antenna before it does to the other. And you compensate for that by putting the delay line in the uh, antenna. And, and this can be as simple as making the cable from one antenna to the receiver longer than the other one. And that's often how it was done, especially in earlier uh, work. Um, this, uh, and, and we talked about the angular resolution, but each one of these antennas equates to what would be a single pixel in a camera array. So you're used to seeing pictures taken with optical, with optical telescopes and, and they're made up of tiny pixels on a CCD chip, but that's a huge number of, of pixels that, and you've got pixels covering large areas, so you've got tons of information to work with. Radio astronomy doesn't have that. It's measuring a set of signals generally not just one, but a complex radio signal, but it's a wide beam about, you know, you saw as much as three degrees, and, uh, and it's basically coming up with a signal level or an intensity, a brightness. And it's, this is, and this is, this is why it got hard to explain, there's, and, uh, hard to study and this is where I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend a little time on this and then I'm gonna have to move past it because I don't understand it all yet myself. <clears throat> but basically they use Fourier transforms which you can take any complex waveform can be represented and made up by a number of simple sinusoidal waveforms different amplitudes and frequencies, add them together, they'll make that complex waveform that you're getting. There is a way to mathematically reverse that process so that you have got the composite sinusoidal waveforms that are being, that you're receiving at various frequencies. And you can plot that in essentially what they call UV space, and it's a, it's a it's the same as north, south, east, and west, it, but it's, it's UV. I don't know why they do that. I didn't figure that part out yet. But it, uh, by, using, by plotting those individual uh, sinusoidal waves, they can essentially come up with a point spread function, which is what you get with light and the diffraction limit of light on a CCD chip, I think. <laughs> At the end of the day, they wind up with a number of spots that can be plotted and you, you take a measurement and let the earth rotate and take another measurement and let the earth rotate and take another measurement. So this, is a, this for example, is a plot of th three or four antennas at, with measurements taken over the period of the earth rotating, whatever that amounts to. You add more antennas to that and you can get more information and you take it at different times you get more information like they they take they move these antennas out in the widespread take all their data then move them back in tight and fill in the, a lot of the gaps with more data <sighs> a 
let me uh, my so this um, so this is more arrays I, I'll get back to that in a minute uh, this is more arrays and this is this is where they're they will use these to fill in gaps uh, this is another kind of telescope this works more like phased array radar uh, system this is this is cool this is being done in Australia each one of these antenna sets uh, it runs into a, a computer controlled box here that can apply a delay to each one of these so that it steers the direction that this array of antennas is looking and they can do that to all of these and this is just the beginning they're planning on putting like hundreds of these things out in this desert in Australia and this is going to be one of the world's biggest uh, radio telescope arrays it's a different kind of technology but it's uh, pretty cool <clears throat> now, getting back to aperture synthesis so each telescope basically adds up to one pixel uh, interferometry adds more pixels by adding more telescopes. Um, <coughs> I talked about the earth rotation, the fast Fourier, and then the trick is the deconvolution. So they, they use image processing of this uh, uh, plotted data to fill in the gaps of all the missing pixels. And that is a tricky process. It looks a lot like this, um, and and this is the point, and I, and I haven't I haven't got a good explanation for it. But if you listen to some of these interviews about how they uh, created the image of the black hole, they always talk about the model. They had a computer generated model that they that they had to make the data fit. All right, so that, and that was the thing that got me. That's the thing that makes me want to question, did we really see a black hole, right? You, 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 you're biasing the data with what you expect it to look like. And they did, a, as the more you dig into it, the more you listen to some of the presentations, they got some great YouTube videos of some of the scientists that have gone around the country making presentations about this. They did a really, I think a good job of eliminating the possibility that their bias is overly influencing the image. But basically, you've got to tell it what you think you're looking at. And then you go through a deconvolution program and you do that over and over again until it starts to look like what you want it to look like. And then they have a whole other set of algorithms that they call clean, and that's the, uh, uh, the apparently the standard in radio astronomy picture making is this set of algorithms called clean, and uh, they apparently didn't like the results they got using the clean algorithms for the Event Horizon Telescope, so they had to invent some of their own. And then they come out with the final picture. <sighs> this gets complicated, which is why this presentation isn't going into that, <laughs> that deeply. <laughs> but it was quite an impressive event. Uh, they did start this. This is the telescopes that were involved. Uh, they started collecting this data in 2006. I had no idea about that part. They where they finished collecting data in 2017, they collected petabytes of data, right? Not, not megabytes or gigabytes, but petabytes of data. And that was so much data that the idea of trying to move it across the internet was just not feasible. The way that they connected these telescopes in that earlier diagram I talked about how they would make the transmission line from one telescope longer to make up for the fact that the signal got there first, so it had to go a longer path to get to the radio. To, to manage that process against worldwide spread apart telescopes that weren't connected at all, 
they had to use atomic clocks to create a synchronization method that they could use to synchronize this data. So they could get the, uh, get the data down to the correct hump in a wave. You know, that you're, you're looking at matching this wave to this wave uh, received from across the world and fitting them together so that you've got the right hump here with the right hump here and they're not canceling each other out or, or whatever. And that is, that is fascinating. Well, how do they physically put them together? Mail each other flash drives? Or <laughs> <laughs> they bought, they bought seats on airplanes. No, they, they, they didn't, uh, uh, they were shipped. They, most of the time, people carried them. They wouldn't trust uh, the, the container. And they were, they, were, they were drive clusters about like this. And they were carried on airplanes back to the place, what we call sneaker knit, right? Like they used to do with video. That's right. <laughs> and, and processing would have started in April 2017, except for the last uh, uh, data set uh, you can't get from the South Pole in April, right? <laughs> that didn't that didn't cut, that didn't get leave the South Pole until December of 2017. So, uh, yeah. The two of uh, the abbreviations in the USA. Where are they located? GBT. GBT is Green Bank, and that is uh, uh, Virginia, West Virginia. Uh, VLB, a very long baseline observatory. Uh, I thought that was in Arizona, but that's sure isn't where it looks like. Uh, yeah, probably not. Uh, these, uh, the Atacama, uh, Alma, Radio Array, Apex, I'm not, I don't know anything about. Uh, the submillimeter array, this is in Hawaii. I think this is located close to where the KECs are. Um, JCMT, I'm not sure what that one stands for. I don't know any of these. Uh, I'll have to look them up. They used, and, and this is, this was, uh, yeah, this is the beginning data capture. They collected the data, converted it to digital, stored it on hard drives, and flew it to a central computer, central computing network, which was 800 computers networked together at a, uh, what do they got, 40 gigabit per second network. You know, that's fast. And it was a grid computing s setup. Um, this is all glass. You can't do 40 gig in, uh, with, with copper. So. Uh, uh, this, this was a healthy computing arrangement, and it took them 2017 till uh, to a year and a half, two years almost, to run through all the math, do all the calculations, check themselves. That it's a lot of this modeling that they did um, took, they took random pictures off the internet to produce a an array of images that they used as their model for getting the data to fit. And even that, even that made it come out like they were expecting it to. So they're pretty confident that what they are showing us is probably what a uh, black hole event horizon looks like. And this is it. Independent. Yes, just for that reason. Yeah, so nobody was talking to anybody else about what they were seeing, so that they would get this. This is the best we can do. This is the best we can do. The best we can do. And put it all together. This was the computer-generated models they were working with.
I'm not sure it's said there, but that black hole is as big as our galaxy, right? And the matter, the plasma that's wrote, going around it circles that thing in two days. That's moving. Have they figured out why it's not bipolar or are we just not seeing part of it or what? All, all the pictures I've ever seen. Of just the one, the one jet. One yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't checked that. So, so we're amateur astronomers, and I thought I would uh, take this uh, moment to segue into the possibilities of amateur radio astronomy. And turns out that's a healthy hobby going on in this country as well. Uh, the more I look on the internet, the more stuff there is out there, uh, especially nowadays. Uh, there is... Uh, Back in the day when Jansky and everybody else, the Arecibo, those radios were complicated and expensive. Nowadays, they have what are called software-defined radios, basically very complex radio circuits. Basically what they are, field programmable gate arrays that have been, that through software can do everything a very complicated radio can. Um, they're called software-defined radios. Uh, they, they have very wide uh, frequency ranges. Um, they started out, and, and, and the thing that drove them to cheapness was USB TV sticks. I don't know if you remember, but about uh, maybe 20 years ago, uh, portable laptops, you could get a USB TV stick for your laptop. It was a little bit of USB plug-in dongle with a little cable. In fact, here's one right here. This is it. You know, I've had this thing for 20-something years. Uh, this plugged into my laptop and stuck that up and you got TV right there on your laptop. That's was all there was to it. The software on your laptop that uh, showed you television. So, <clears throat> Ham radio operators, radio experimentalists have, have taken this stuff. These chips probably would have died. These chipsets would have died 20 years ago if it weren't for ham radio operators and eBay. You can buy these things. Uh, I think I paid probably 70 or 80 bucks for this, maybe more than that way back then. You can buy these all day long for eight bucks now on eBay. Uh, same chipset. Uh, there's open source software out there to control them, to work with them, to so that you can see what you've got. Um, these are, the, the frequency range on these were basically VHF and UHF or into the, uh, into the low microwaves. I think these go up to 1.2 gigahertz or something like that. Uh, this is a this is a block converter that shifts those high frequencies no shifts low frequencies up so that I can use this to listen to ham radio on the higher frequencies there so it shifts up the uh, frequency uh, this is an L band uh, satellite antenna and uh, SDR for experiments in L band satellite reception which I did for a while. <laughs> And, uh, but there are plenty of them out there. There's open source software. The thing, the thing that's got to happen is the antennas. And lo and behold, that is a 1.42 gigahertz homemade antenna. Uh, this is a set of school made. Uh, this is taped together aluminized foam board. This is a square paint can or some kind of square sheet metal can and a RF connector and a, and a piece of wire in the middle of it and that's all there is to that. So I'm going to have one of these pretty soon to go with, <laughs> to go with my radios. <laughs> of course, just like our regular optical astronomy hobby, it can get expensive too. Uh, you can go out and buy a big dish and a, and a nice controlled uh, uh, pointing mount for it. And 
fact, that looks like a, a telescope mount. Uh, and uh, spend a lot of money or not. So I'm going to go this route. I'll let you know how it goes. Oh, I, I was going to show you. Uh, So that's four, uh, let's see, what is that? That's 10 megahertz. So this is a software defined radio right here. This is actually one of the better ones. This one goes from 100 megahertz to six gigahertz. So this is quite a wide bandwidth. Uh, this one will also transmit, which is fun for amateur radio <laughs> playing. And uh, this is what I'm going to hook up to one of those antennas and center on 1.4 gigahertz and see if I can't go find the center of our uh, Milky Way galaxy with it. It all runs right here off my USB cable to my laptop. So, uh, I use it as a spectrum analyzer when I'm doing ham radio work to see where signals are in a much broader range than my ham radio receiver will, uh, will pick up at one time. So I can look all across a ham band and see who, where transmitted signals are. And this thing gets, uh, is real sensitive, so I can pick out some really low level signals, which is pretty cool. So uh, that's my presentation on radio astronomy.